An EPC, it stands for Energy Performance Certificate. And uh, the idea is, is you need to discover how energy efficient your property is. No. There's, there's, there's certain things that you can spend a vast amount of money on that don't have a very big effect on an EPC. Yeah. And always get advice from an energy assessor rather than an electrician or a, a heating engineer. They're yeah. experts in their field, uh, not necessarily knowing the right way to um, improve the energy efficiency of a property for the EPC purpose. Hello, it's Simon Zucci, and in this video, we're talking all things EPC, Energy Performance Certificates. Now, there's something big is happening in a couple of years. You need to know about this, and I'm really delighted I've got an absolute expert joining me today. So David Foggett has been a domestic energy assessor since 2007. He really knows this very well, and actually, it's it's not a really black and white area, I feel. I think there's a lot of complexity. And I actually met David. He was at one of my uh, three-day Mastermind Accelerator events. Him and his son were coming to learn more about some of the investing strategy we use. And we were just talking. And David was showing something that I, I just had no idea about. And I thought, look, if I don't know this stuff, there'll be lots of our clients who also aren't aware. And I, I invited David, and he's graciously accepted, to come and just us have a little bit of a chat all about EPCs and what's happening. And I'm sure you're going to get some massive value from this. So first of all, welcome, David. How are you? Yes. Yeah, thank you, Simon. Yeah, very well. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for inviting me along. I'm really pleased to be here. Thank well, you. my pleasure. I'm sure people get massive value from this. So look, I know there are going to be people with different levels of experience watching this. And let's just start for people who don't even know what an EPC is. Do you want to explain a little bit about what it is and, and how you get it and why you actually need it? Uh, so um, an EPC, it stands for Energy Performance Certificate. And uh, the idea is, is you need to discover how energy efficient your property is. Um, it's a legal requirement. So you must have one to sell a house or to rent a house. Um, and uh, you need an en a domestic energy assessor to come along to your property and carry out a visual inspection. Um, lasts about 30 to 45 minutes, depends on the size of the property. Yeah. Um, and um, he has to be um, registered with an accreditation scheme who a government backed accreditation scheme. So um, and then once he's gathered all the information from your property, he'll go away, enter all into a um, government database and it produces a certificate to tell you how energy your house is or isn't. Mm. And it also gives you some standard answers as to how you can improve your property that are generated yeah. from the information that, that, that's put in. And you need to have one before you sell or rent a property, don't you, really? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. Yes, you have to have one before you market a, a property for sale or for rent. Yes. Yeah. Now, interestingly, obviously, I, I guess one of the reasons they created this, and I think it all started when they when they created the home buyer packs, uh, yes. which were eventually yes. were scrapped, obviously, yeah. but it's something that, yeah. that came up with that that was then disbanded. But I guess that the point is that whoever's buying the house or renting the house it's giving them an indication of, of how energy efficient it is and thus how much the bills might cost because a less efficient property is gonna, you're probably gonna spend more on gas and electric, I would have thought. Yeah, that, that's the idea. I mean, everything is all assessed to the same level. It's all assessed. We assess the building, not the occupants. So yeah. it's all assessed to the same level so that you can compare um, property to property with the mm. EPCs per square foot. Um, yeah. So you can see how energy efficient your house is compared to your neighbor's house. So if you're yeah. looking at renting a property, for example, you can only rent one that is really energy efficient because you know that your bills would be comparatively cheaper than if you're renting one that's not as energy efficient. Yeah, and even if, uh, now normally in, in most single let properties, it's the tenants who are responsible for paying the bills. Um, yeah. But as you know, we, we do a lot of HMO properties, a house of multiple occupation where we rent yeah. out rooms to people and they pay one amount which is the rent including all the bills so sure. in that case we the landlords pay for the bills but we still need to have an epc we still need to show the new tenants epc as well don't we yes that's right yes and yeah. that's a good point because obviously from a landlord's point of view um it's actually quite important to have a, a as high an epc rating as possible because yeah. the higher the rating the lower the bills so if that especially affects... with the increasing energy costs that we're all seeing at the moment absolutely yes yeah, yeah. because the tenants aren't going to be worried about the increase in, in cost if they're not paying the bills so no, exactly then... now david there, there are some types of property that are actually exempt from uh from this because although they have to have an epc rating there's there's a minimum level at the moment isn't there 
that if you're renting a property out, you have to have a, a certain banding, but some properties are exempt. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, they're sort of exempt. There's a very strange, there's a very strange wording in the, in the, in the rules, um, but listed properties, um, if they're being rented, um, they don't have to have an EPC, but they do to prove that they comply with minimum energy efficiency standards. So this is actually a good point you've raised because people think they're exempt, but they're sort of not really. Right. So you still need to have an EPC, but it might show that the rating is very low. Um, you still have to get one, whether you're renting a listed building or a standard run of the mill building. You still have yeah. to have an EPC. Yeah. OK, because I, I have... Uh... A couple of listed buildings and uh for example we've got uh the, the original sash windows in there and the yeah. council said category we cannot change them we cannot replace them etc and so because no. of that it, it's really hard to heat the units and so the, the energy rating is not very good because there's not a lot we can do about it but i think it's no. exempt we have the certificate but it's exempt because it's listed um it's exempt from making those um improvements to the property yes, yes yeah, that's right that's yes. correct yeah now the, the the big news here oh sorry what, what's the range of costs for someone to get an epc and how often do people have to get them um you so what, once you have an epc it's valid for 10 years and um you are required to get one when it runs out so basically every 10 years but you can yeah. get one if you make improvements to the property to show that your um, epc is higher um and costs range from um, sort of 60, 70 pounds up until sort of 100 pounds. So they're not yeah. massively expensive just for a basic sort of standard EPC. OK, now, um, one of the big bits of news uh, that's been banded around a lot of the forums and chats is that the it's being proposed by the government that they want to uh, bring some new legislation in in 2025 that all properties are being rented out have to have a C or above uh, energy performance certificate rating and the reality is that many properties don't have that and I think this is going to cause a little bit of an issue so should we talk a little bit around that and what's the policy and it's not in place yet it it might come in I believe it is going to but do you want to talk a little bit about that please David yeah sure of course yeah well so so currently um, you have to have a property that's in band E or higher so if, if a property is in a band F or G um, you can't rent it out and you have yep. to make improvements to it to get it into band F, uh, sorry, E. Um, but um, it's been debated in Parliament um, very soon in the next couple of weeks. Um, they're looking to increase that to band C from April 2025. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of hurdles and hoops to sort of jump and skip over to, to, to get to that point. Um, and there also is an exemption process, which I think what you're discussing earlier about um, um, listed properties to go through. So some properties can be exempt from doing it, but you have to go through certain processes. Yep. Some properties you need to improve um, to get them into band C and you'll have to pay for that yourself, basically. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And we'll, we'll talk about that because that's that's one of the big lessons that I had from talking to. I want to say that and come back to that. Um, but. I think there's actually this is going to present a bit of an opportunity. You see, I have seen from all the pin meetings we do around the country and speaking to other kind of people who deal with lots of landlords. Um, there are a huge number of landlords who are deciding to retire early, to sell up for a number of reasons. And it's a lot of the government legislation that's come in. Um, Section 24 that came in April 2017, being phased over a few years increased HRO licensing, this coming in, uh, COVID, and, and the last 10 years, properties have done really well. And I think a lot of landlords are thinking about selling up and cashing in. And this, I think, will be one more reason, because people think, well, I can't be, I don't want to spend that money, and I don't want that hassle, etc. Mm. Um, so I think there's going to be some opportunities where people might have properties that are not up to standard, that they're, they're not yeah. going to be up to C, they might sell. So what can we do if we're taking those properties on? What, what are some of the things that people can do in our property to improve the, the rating? And then we'll come on to the learning that I got that you shared with me about the mistake that many people are making when trying to do this. So, so what are some of the common things people would do to a property? Well, the, the common things you can do is you can insulate the walls. If it's a cavity wall, it's quite cheap and um, easy to do. A local authority normally can provide services to do that. You can insulate loft. That's yet again quite a cheap and easy thing to do. 
you can um, improve your heating controls. So uh, you can put thermostatic radiator valves on the radiators, TRVs or thermostats. Um, you can put laundry lighting throughout the whole property. Um, they're the sort of cheap things you can do. Yeah. Um, uh, however, there are more expensive things if you've got a solid wall house. So like a, a Victorian or Edwardian house, which is uh, what a lot of HMOs are, um, they've mainly got solid walls. Yeah. So that's a lot more expensive to insulate a solid wall um, and time consuming. Mm. Um, so um, you can replace the windows, but yet, yet again, um, replacing the windows, if I'm just talking about an EPC now, to replace the windows from a single glazed window to a double glazed window will only increase a couple of points. It doesn't make that large a difference on a property. So yeah, so a in a minute. So even though it would have a, a very real practical effect on the ability to to uh, insulate that property and, and be more efficient, as far as the EPC is concerned, it doesn't have that much of an effect. No, there's, there's, there's certain things that you can spend a vast amount of money on that don't have a very big effect on an EPC. Yeah. And I think this is a big mistake I want to make people aware of because you get landlords who are trying to do the right thing. They, they, they're hearing about this, they're anticipating it. And, and you shared with me a, a real breakthrough that I want to share with everyone. And you explained that, you know, maybe you get a report and it says, OK, actually, if you have a story cheater, forgive me if I'm quoting the wrong things, but an example, sure. a story yeah. cheater could be something that could improve it and yeah. you know there's the 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 guideline products that have all been checked by the is it uh, the british research federation establishment establishment right british yeah. research establishment they've been yeah. approved and you can go and buy one of those things put it in and and it will improve the rating right yeah but and i didn't know this if a product is not on that approved list you might have a new product that's come out that is actually really amazingly efficient. It might be a better product than the ones on the approved list, but because they haven't got around to approving it yet, let's say you go to a supplier and the approved one's not available and the supplier says, oh, well actually we've got this new thing, it's really amazing. And you put that in instead and it might be a better system and it might actually improve the efficiency much, much more, but because it's not on the list, it won't increase the rating at all. That's correct, isn't it? That's exactly true, yes. And I didn't exactly know that. True. And I, I was flabbergasted when you told me. And I suppose it kind of makes sense, really. But it's a case of, to me, and, and, you know, maybe I can be a bit more critical here, but I think the system feels a bit flawed. And it feels a bit like a, a computer says no or a computer says yes exercise rather than being a practical thing. And maybe you don't want to comment on that. I don't know. But that's just my, my view from... From this place saying well it doesn't seem like a, a perfect system well if but basically once a product is on the database that would that we draw that we draw from um we can select its exact efficiency but yeah. if it isn't on the database then we have to go worst case scenario so it gives you a reduced efficiency so yeah. therefore if it hasn't been tested yet then therefore it isn't on the database so then i guess there are so many products and things there's, there's going to be a bit of a lag from when a product comes absolutely, out absolutely yeah yeah. it's actually tested right so you might have yeah. the best latest thing that actually so here's a big tip if you're going to make improvements on your property to try and raise the epc rating it's really important you get advice from someone like david to make sure the actual things you're putting in are the correct things that are going to have an impact as far as the epc is concerned otherwise although it's it is actually improving the efficiency you won't get any credit for that on your EPC report. We we have recommended people use a specific product and um, they've used an electrician to install that specific product. But the electrician said, I've got the newer model than that product. Therefore, I recommend you use this new model because it's more efficient, which he is correct. Yeah. However, because they use the newer model, it wasn't yet tested by Bree and therefore it wasn't on the database. So on the system, we had to give it a reduced efficiency, which therefore meant that the report didn't get as high as what the client wanted. Yeah, and, that's and, and that is that is crazy, really. But I can see how it could happen. But that yeah. is kind of crazy. So that's that's one of the main things I wanted everyone to understand, because I'd hate people to think they're doing the right thing, go out, get that advice, and hey, here's a better system, but actually it not count. So uh, that's a really valuable lesson.
yeah, no, that's 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 definitely a valuable lesson that he learned. Yes. <laughs> so so what do you think people should be doing now? Do you think we kind of need to wait till the government announcement comes out? Because very often things are discussed and muted, but they don't actually come into play or, or there's a slightly watered down version. Uh, what uh, if you had your crystal ball out and you had to make a prediction? Do you, do you think it's going to happen, what they're suggesting, or do you think I'll go to a D rating? Or what, what do you think is going to happen? It's just I, a guess, right? OK, so so definitely something's going to change. Um, yeah. So uh, it, it won't stay as only in band E. Um, we need to reduce um, our, en our energy con consumption. And this is the way that we are um, helping the, the planet to reduce its energy consumption. So the government have signed up to say we need to reduce our carbon emissions and you know this is how they're going to do it so um definitely something will change whether it does go all the way to c or not i i, I don't know I've, I've got a horrible feeling that it will do um, yeah. i know I, I deal with a, a lot of um estate agents or letting agents who are very concerned that if it does then a lot of a lot of um landlords will want to um offload their products because they yeah. know that it's going to be quite expensive to I, I, I think, think that, it's going to be quite. I think that's too. correct. And and if you think about it, that one thing, if a lot of there are two million plus landlords in the UK, and if many of them decide to put, they write this, I'm going to put it on the market, yeah. um, and that that could be a bit of a an excess, and not going to be all of them, obviously. And, and there's always no. people exiting and always people entering the market, yeah. but it could be an unprecedented amount of a property on the market, which and that doesn't meet the right standard. Mm. Thus, might not sell, and though that could affect market values, maybe. And another issue I've just thought of that is important at that point in time is that if I'm selling a property that currently isn't in band E, so it's in band F or G, and if you want to buy it with a buy to let mortgage, your mortgage company won't lend you the money because they know you can't rent it out. So the same will happen for a band C. Yeah. So from 2025, if you've got a band property that's um, that the band is lower than band C, you won't be able to sell it to another investor because the mortgage companies won't lend them the money. Yeah. What about if someone's buying it for a home to live in? Is, is this just for rental property? This is currently, it's just for rental purposes. Okay. Just that's, rental. that's interesting because you kind of think, you know, obviously there are, you know, two million plus landlords and, and I don't know how many millions rented homes, but there's also all the private homes as well. And, yeah. and there's probably yeah. a lot more private homes than there are rented properties. Yeah. So you would, because we are a nation of homeowners, so you might think, well, why is the government not doing anything to homeowners? But is it because, again, they don't want to annoy voters and mm. actually, um, you know, landlords are an easy target, which is how many of us feel at the moment. Um, uh, Maybe you can't yes. comment. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we might need to edit that bit out. I don't know. But, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of landlords are feeling attacked by... Yeah. The current yeah. government because I mean, of all the legislation and look, the government don't want to have millions and millions of independent landlords they want to have companies and corporates providing yeah. the private rental sector and that's one of the reasons i think they introduced section 24 to, yeah. to put some people off um, yeah. I, I suppose those of us who stay are going to probably do well because there might be less rental property available out there which higher demand higher price i mean rents at the moment are ridiculously high which is, mm. which is good for us not so good for tenants um, but I can see it only getting worse, unfortunately, for tenants because I, I see a lack of supply. Yeah, um, it's going to be difficult for tenants because there are going to be a lot of properties that, like I say, that a landlord might want to sell his property, but he can only sell it to someone that can buy it to live in it. Yeah. So yeah. therefore, there are going to be there is going to be potentially a reduced amount of properties that could be that could be let. Yes. Yeah. Indeed. So it's interesting. We're going to have to see what happens. Uh, so it looks like there's definitely going to be some sort of change. But if it's going to be up to see, we don't know. Um, but I think this is important for all landlords to realise. And I guess there'll be uh, a certain grace period where people have a certain amount of time to get up to that standard. Or have they given any guidance on that? Um, but they have. It's a bit complicated. Um, uh, but um, <laughs> so it's April, April 25 for existing tenancies. Right. It's April 28 for all tenancies. OK. However, the irrelevance of that is that you can't wait until April 28, because if you've got an existing tenant and you go past April 25 and then your tenant moves out a month later, you can't let that until you've made the improvement. So it's irrelevant. It. You know, you've got to get it done by April 25. Yeah. 
So really, it, it's if an announcement comes out, let's say April 22, people yeah. have got three years to, to do something to sort it out, but they've got to make yeah. sure what they're actually doing is going to actually move up the scale uh, yeah. and ticking that box, computer yeah. says yes kind of thing, uh, yeah. to, to make sure they're complying. It, it, it is very easy to spend a lot of money in the wrong area. Yeah. And I think that's got to be one of the key messages. And that was the thing I was completely shocked on. So, mm. so David, look, I, I just want to say thanks so much for your time coming to share well, this. And any final thoughts you want to share with people? Uh, no, I think that, that was really it, is just, just um, be very careful spending a lot of money in the wrong area and always get advice from an energy assessor rather than an electrician or a, a heating engineer. They're yeah. experts in their field and uh, not necessarily knowing the right way to um, improve the energy efficiency of a property for the EPC purpose. Yeah, absolutely. That's great advice. So guys, I do hope you've enjoyed watching this video. Uh, if you liked it, maybe tick the like icon, put some questions below. Maybe David can come and answer some things. Um, and, you know, want to subscribe to the channel as well. If you subscribe to this channel, uh, we have new videos coming out all the time, interviews like this, case studies, etc., strategies. It's a really great way to build your knowledge. So uh, click the like and hit the bell icon to make sure you get notified. Subscribe to the channel. I look forward to sharing lots more information with you. And we've lined up another video that might be really useful for you to watch as well. So as always, I encourage you to invest with knowledge, invest with skill. David, thank you so much for your time. I'll speak to you later. Thank, thank you. I do hope you got massive value from watching this YouTube video. I'd encourage you to click on the link below to come and do the online training with me. And I've got another video lined up for you, which I think is also going to be really useful that you should watch once you've registered for the online training with me. So invest with knowledge, invest with skill. I'll see you very soon.